the time factor. I think that faculty are almost always blown away by how much time it takes to prepare an online course and teach an online course. So I give them some guidelines. Frequently they will not necessarily think that I'm right, but most of the time they'll come back and say, now I get it, now I understand. And the timing, you know, it could be anything from I would say minimally. I can't remember ever working with an instructor that didn't take at least 20 hours to redesign the syllabus and redesign the learning activities. And that's separate and apart from then building them in the course management system. It's interesting in terms of talking about the perception of the amount of work that faculty may need to put into an online course because you probably do face two extremes. You may find a faculty member who walks in with a notion that he says, well, I have these PowerPoints ready to go that I use in the classroom, we're done. And then you may have a faculty member who comes in and says, well, Professor Smith told me he spent 500 hours on this course. I don't want to spend that much time. How much time will this take? And of course, the ever popular answer that every instructional designer is well trained to say is, it depends. And we don't say that to be facetious because we don't know until we begin to explore exactly the nature of that course, those learning outcomes. What do we need for instructional materials for students to be ready to do the work, to work on assessments? Because we don't know until we really begin to work the engagement, you can ballpark with what I think is a semi-mythical number of, well, gee, it's usually 100 hours is what we think. I don't know that we've ever asked faculty to record their time to know for certain. Um, we do have a sense in terms of what it takes from our support side, how many hours an instructional designer may spend on a typical course. Relax that um, it's, it's um, an experience and you're not going to necessarily do it 100% correct the first time. It's, it's going to take time to get used to it, just like the students. A common mistake that first-time online instructors make is that they try to do exactly the same thing in, in the online environment that they are doing in the classroom. I encourage faculty to not lecture. If they have documents they want students to read, present those documents, but then have the students discuss the documents. Because reading without discussing does not encourage attention to the, to the reading content. Uh, a mistake that a lot of faculty make, in my opinion, is that they provide a study guide with reading content. The study guide is, almost becomes a, a set of things to look for in the reading rather than to read it for the, under, for the understanding that's there. So if I'm trying to answer specific questions, the study guide says I need to know this, so I, look, I scan around until I find the answer and then I write that answer down. You're not really reading with understanding. Uh, a skill that a lot of students don't have when they start a course is they don't have good reading comprehension skills. They don't pay attention. Their mind wanders while they're reading and it's just wasting their time to continue reading. So you keep the reading assignments very short and you make them motivated to read for attention because then they have to discuss. And one of the better ways to get that attention focus is to have them ask questions themselves of what they've just read. Okay, what is it that you didn't understand? What would you like to know more about? Okay, what was not included in the reading that you think should have been, the, that kind of thing. You want them to analyze and critique and uh, become uh, attentive, uh, curious, critically thinking consumers of information. So you keep the reading short, you focus their attention on the content by asking them then to discuss it. And uh, that would be my very first suggestion to a new faculty member is don't videotape yourself and le lecturing to your class. Put your students in charge of reading and then discussing. What do students struggle with most with the tools? Um, I guess just navigating, um, understanding where the information is, and that's where course design comes in. Um, students have trouble when things are not organized in a way that they expect them to be. I like to be very organized and uh, clear about expectations. Um, online students really like concrete, strong uh, due date information. Uh, they like to, things to um, be 
kind of scaffolded in a way inside the course uh, where they can naturally find things and it makes sense. Um, sometimes, you know, instructors who are less experienced might not actually link things and students have to search around for them and that's, that's frustrating for students. Clean course design to me is a nice organized course. You log in, you see the modules one by one. Um, <coughs> unclean course design that I've seen is just everything is thrown in the course. Folders, documents, homework assignments, no order, no flow. Um, if you're logging in as a student, you're going to be confused. You're not sure where to go. You're not directed. So students want to be directed. They want to have a nice flow. Um, hyperlinks is one of my favorite things in a course. So if you're inside a module, you're told you have an, an essay due. Well, let's have a, have, have a hyperlink there to, that goes to a course information document that directly tells you exactly what the professor wants out of that assignment. So it's very, very easy to navigate. Um, one or two clicks, you don't want to have too many clicks. I've seen other courses where they'll have module one folder, then inside the folder they'll have more folders and more folders and it's like five clicks just to get to what I have to do. And the students don't want to do that. My modules have a very uh, consistent structure also. So that once they get through modules one and two, I think they're totally comfortable because they know what to expect. Um, as SLN taught us so well, uh, we have the module overview, module at a glance, which Everything is on one page, in one document. This is all you have to do. Here's your a little few sentences about what you're going to learn. Your course objectives are there. Your discussions, the names of your discussions and links to them are there. Your assignments are there. Your quizzes are there. Uh, your readings are there as well. It's all in one page. As far as the structure of a course, the way it's put together, I think consistency is the most important thing. And not just consistency within a class, but across a program, across a college. Um, so that when a student goes from course to course, some of it's familiar already. They know where to find things. My course, um, because I focus on four different types of literature, is broken down into modules based on those um, four genres. So I start out with short stories and move to poetry, and then we read a novel, and then we read a play. And I don't open the mo all the modules at once, because I want this discussion is a huge part of my course, and I want them all in the same place. So they can see what's coming, but they can't get into the later modules. I also um, put the um, activities in the order that I want them to use them and I tell them that. There's a folder for what's due and when is it due There's a in each module and the course objectives for that module. And then there's um, what we have always called and I still call mini lectures, um, which is the material that's not in the textbook that I want to share with them. And then they do the readings, and then they take a quiz. This is different from a lot of classes, because the quiz is usually the final um, activity in the course, or in the module. But my, um, my quizzes are just to check their reading. Did they do the reading? I don't want them in the discussions until they've done the reading, because they try to fake that they've read the story, or whatever it is. And I want to know that they've actually done it. So they're very factual quizzes, and they're worth very little in my course. But the, they do the quizzes, then they enter the discussion, and then when they've learned about the piece of literature, then they write. So the very last thing is the essays or the written assignments. And all of these are in nice, neat folders. So when they open the module, there are five folders, and that's it. When they open the folders, that's where the meat of the court of that course module is. When they go to the next module, those are the exact same folders they see again. Of course, everything in them is different, but <laughs> it's um, in nice, neat order. I'm not the most organized person myself, so um, it's also an organizing strategy for me, but um, they think I'm organized because it's well so nice and neat. You know, after 15 years, it, it should be. <laughs> um, so. The other reason that I, my modules are about three and a half weeks long, 
and I have four or five discussions in that three and a half weeks. They overlap. They don't all open at the same time because they're reading, and then we have a discussion on that first part of the reading, and then <clears throat> they read some more, and we have another discussion start. Um, I want there to be a good 10 days of, in discussion so that they can go back and forth, bring in new information, and keep the discussion going that long. I know that a lot of course um, designs, you know, the, the philosophy is that uh, you should have about seven modules or, you know, somewhere between five and seven modules for a 15-week course. I have four because that's the way my course is organized. But I'm not a fan of the 15-module course. I think um, those are too short for any meaningful discussion to t get going and take place. Here's, here you go, here's week one, here's your readings, or here's the videos you're going to be watching, or here's this way that you're going to interact with the content. Some kind of then interaction with other students, so whether it's a discussion, um, a group project, something where they are having to meet these other students and work with them through, um, through a learning experience. And then some kind of an assessment, right? So am I writing a paper? Am I submitting a quiz? We don't do a whole lot of quizzes, to be honest. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going back and you're looking at your learning objectives and you're trying to meet a certain level, quizzes are not gonna give you a whole lot of, uh, of higher level learning. So it's usually more project-based papers, those kind of sort of um, interactions or group, especially the group projects, because we know that people learn well with each other. So when I'm a, so I'm a student going through the course, that's what I'm kind of seeing, this modular structure. I do provide e-notes for every um, module as well, which are, you know, simply um, documents that go beyond the textbook, uh, might be something that explains something in the textbook, um, additional information. Sometimes our most powerful tools are the ones that are right there at our disposal all along. Uh, so I think exploiting uh, what a standard learning management system can do for frequent quizzing is, is fantastic. It ties very well to a wealth of research we have on the value of frequent low stakes quizzing for memory. And that's one of the things that an LMS can do really well. Um, sometimes it means you have to go back to your publisher and put them on the spot and say, uh, okay, I need all of the test questions in the test bank and I need you to put them in my LMS and I'm gonna sample out, uh, out of this large database to create randomly generated quizzes. That's not how most test banks were designed to be used, but they will, they can do that if you, um, if you stick with it and set them up to do that. Other things that I do is I allow students, I, go, I do give traditional quizzes in the class. Um, they're open book, open note. They, I mean, I don't try to force a student to you know, show their ID or whatever, but they're open everything. Because again, I think that learning happens in many ways. And learning happens in testing quizzes too. And I believe that at the core of you know, my, my educational core is that learning happens not just when they're reading a lecture or not just when, the, when, when they're doing an assignment. It happens even in the, in the exam part of things and the quiz part of things as well. So they can look at everything. The quiz that I use to test whether they've actually read, it, there, it's a combination of short answer, true and false, and multiple choice. It's all objective. It's, I'm not asking them to do any analysis of the literature. I ask them what color the boy's hat was in chapter two that kind of thing. So if they haven't read it, they can't answer it. If they want to go and look for the boy's hat in chapter two, great. That means they have to open the book. And so I don't, ca I don't care. You have to create um, those kinds of quizzes knowing that they're open book, open notes, collaborative with anybody else that they might have in the room or someone online. You can't control any of that, so you have to create your tests with all that in mind. So for that reason, quizzes don't count very much in my grade. Discussion is worth about 40% of the overall course grade, and um, the papers, because it is a writing class, the papers are worth 50%, and the other 10% are the, are the quizzes. So there's probably nine quizzes in my course. They will argue over a one point on one quiz, and I eventually I'll get to the point where I'll say, do you realize that this is 
0.0001% of your grade that you're arguing about. It's <laughs> I could give it to you, but it isn't really going to make a big difference. So some of the specific elements that I use in the design, of course, of online courses to engage the students are activities specifically. You want to have icebreaker activities to start the class off, to start building a community, start interacting, the students can learn about each other. Words are like a basic level of it, but if you can add a picture of yourself or a video of yourself or audio of yourself, it, you really get to know and trust the person that you're, you're learning with in the course. Um, and discussions is another activity. You want to have the students interacting with each other a lot. Um, group projects, you have students working together. Anything that can get the students engaged and interacting with each other is going to build another level to that community and, and to that trust. In a nutshell, what I tell faculty about ensuring student engagement is that you're going to refer to everything you already know about engaging students in a traditional classroom, and you're going to put it on steroids. Because that's what needs to happen for you to keep students engaged when they don't have the benefit of seeing you on a regular basis. Online environments are also rife with distractions. It's just how they are. So if I'm getting that bad feeling about a class, that I'm less motivated or I'm anxious about my performance, well, to avoid that, all I have to do is maybe not turn the computer on. And since I have control over my schedule and there's oftentimes not real clear expectations about when I'm supposed to be on and when I don't have to be, I can really avoid that computer. And suddenly doing my laundry is a lot more appealing and, and all the other things I have going on in my life. And when I do turn on the computer, oh, well, there's email, there's Facebook, there's the shopping site. So we do really need, I feel, to be very planful about the motivation component. And that's not something I think faculty are used to. I think by now many faculty know you go in with a plan for the learning. You've got your objectives, you've got your content, you don't just walk in cold the first day. But that's what we do when it comes to something like procrastination. So I've really come to believe that we do in this technology environment in particular, you got to have a plan. We have to have, have our faculty start to ask, you know, what's going to keep the students engaged throughout the semester? Something other than, well, they need it for a grade. That does, that's not the same as motivation. You need to say, here's how I plan to bring them in at the beginning of the course and sustain them and keep them coming in and doing what they need to do all the way through to the last day. It really becomes possible to, for, the, for the instructor to turn over a lot of the responsibility to the students themselves. Uh, they become more responsible for their own learning. They are more willing and able to determine their own learning path because they're not in this situation where everybody's progressing through a class 50 minute time period at the same pace. Uh, anytime there's an opportunity for the instructor to step back and, and watch individuals choose their own pace, their own uh, tempo, the content that they are em emphasizing is a choice that they make uh, just giving them this additional responsibility. Uh, at the end of the course, one of the most common comments I get when I ask for them to review the course and it, to evaluate their learning experience was that they really appreciated the fact that the course was customized by them for, for themselves. And that even though they had to read chapters in a textbook and take exams on the chapter in the textbook, those topics which they selected were those that they were the most interested in, that were the most meaningful for them, that they found the most value in. I have a professor who does um, uh, small group projects. I worked with him to set up his groups. And the students um, create a paper together that they then present to the rest of the class. And I had a hard time convincing him to, at first, to use the small groups. He said he used them in class and he didn't like them and the students didn't like them. And I said, well, tell me what you don't like about them. Well, not everybody does the work. They never find a time to meet up. Uh, some people are slackers and it turns out one person does all the work and other people get credit and they don't like that. And I said, all of those things can be fixed in an online um, project, small group project uh, forum because you know who went in and did the work. You can see it, and so can they. You could also set it up so that they rate each other's uh, uh, participation and contribution. And you don't have to give everybody the same grade because you can see who put in the most effort. So 
it eliminates a lot of those objections to small groups. And then they have a product that is right there in the course and they can show it to the rest of the class. And then you, they can have a discussion on that as a larger group. At the baseline skill acquisition level, we actually leverage uh, really some fantastic publisher-created automated labs um, that allow the students to do simulations of desktop software, one, without the expense of owning the software, and two, without having to worry about gaining access to the software. Uh, and again, selfishly from an instructor perspective, the automation level means that I can teach the course at scale to far more students than I could if I was having to manually grade and review each assignment. The level of automation, frankly, improves, I think, with each successive year. That's the skill and drill component uh, in terms of acquisition. As an instructor, I have developed and taught a course completely on my own, just mine. And then I have revised a course that is not something I was going to be teaching. And I've taught a course that I've never developed. Um, and so the differences between those really comes down to um, taking, taking the time at the beginning to learn the course yourself, right? If you didn't set it up, then you need to go through and you need to click on everything. You need to make sure that you familiarize yourself with the course before it gets going so you know, okay, what you're putting yourself in the mind of whoever did develop it and say, well, why did they do it this way? And what can I do to, to maybe make it my own a little bit without uh, changing it so much that we've, you, know, you don't want to pull it away from the course objectives, right? So that's, that's the approach that we take with our instructors. Here's the course, but we make sure they get into the course well ahead enough so they get three weeks before the course opens to get in there and be able to look around, poke around, see what it is. Um, once the, one, now, that's only brand new, right, if you've never taught that particular course. But once you've taught it, you get more comfortable with it. So it's, it's just like anything else you do for the first time, right? So it, it's really more about um, getting in there early and spending the time to familiarize yourself with the course. Then you can start doing the, the personalization, right? That's when you can go in and you can start infusing it with your knowledge and what you do and how you approach learning. You can, if you want to make changes down the road, you just talk with the, the lead faculty member that's got that course, right? So you, there's a, always a constant conversation. You're never out there on your own, right? There's a, besides instructional designers being available, if you're, say, teaching as an adjunct, there are full-time faculty members who, who work on this course. And so they're always there for you. You can always talk to them. You can ask them. Um, so there's a constant communication happening between the, the instructors. Well, what I really wanted to do and one of my core beliefs when you're looking at an online course is the ability to bring in outside voices. No matter what I personally do, I can't match the production value of something like a TV show or a movie. And that online course structure truly gives you the ability to pull in these external resources. Some are actually designed OERs and some are just things that you look at and say that is interesting. So for my course I took the contents of the textbook and the textbook PowerPoint slides that were provided and I went through one by one and customized the slides and added notes at the bottom and published them as PDFs. So you had the slide was my visual component, then my personal notes. Then I used an old trick that unfortunately doesn't work anymore to embed videos directly onto the PDF. So essentially I had my explanation, the book's explanation, and then a third explanation from something like Khan Academy or whatnot. And then I could also have a visual explanation uh, to say, okay, here is what this experiment I'm talking about uh, looks like. The big thing is going to be through discussions and through adding extra content. So in other words, if there's a discussion question written, and maybe it's not really resonating with you, right? So you can you can adjust that. You can come in and you can say, "Hey, let's 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 look at it this way," or you know. So you're going to be able to go through and and um, that when so when I say kind of make it your own, that's what I mean. So if this, if the question's not resonating with you, if 
there's a piece of content that you feel is missing, you can bring that in. You know, so there's always those, those little spots where you go, oh, this doesn't, something's not feeling right here. And so it, it's perfectly acceptable to at that point come in and say, hey, we, let's look at it this way instead. Or, you know, and, and that's also where the, the conversation with the other faculty members come in. You know, it's important to have that, that open dialogue um, because maybe they intended to do something and it's not coming through right. So if you have that conversation, then, the, then that full-time faculty member will say, oh, this is really what I meant. And now we can adjust it and we can make it better for the student. So that's one way that you can do that. The other way, I really would like faculty to be able to do more video. So, you know, there's one thing to be able to go onto a discussion forum or something and just say, hey, let's see, you know, talk about it this way. But if you can bring in a little bit of yourself, and some people don't like to be on camera, right? But if, the, if you can sit down and just take a few minutes, do a quick video. There's so many different programs out there now that would help you do that. Get that out in front of the students. It's going to increase that presence for them and you're going to be able to then make it your own, right? You can get in there and you can talk about it. You can lecture more if you want to lecture. Or you can, you know, draw the students out. Tell them what do you want them to be doing this particular week and encourage them to maybe dig deeper than what the content that is there, right? So there's, there's, those are some of the different ways that you could do that. Now when we look at how do you express your passion to students, one issue is, is that passion is very hard to communicate via text. Now, we have more ability these days to post video of ourselves as a professor and to be able to inject our own interest and passion into the subject matter. But looking more broadly than that, not every faculty member is going to be comfortable in front of a camera. And I think this is really where you can look at the external resources because there are always people out there that are passionate about, passionate about whatever your subject matter is. Sticking with physics, it's very easy for me to go find videos of, uh, of Dr. Tyson or going back further looking at some of the famous uh, science fiction authors. And of course, now that I'm on camera, all their names have escaped to me, but uh, even Isaac Asimov had a lot of science trends in his stuff. And so you can pull that enthusiasm from third parties and say, look at what you can do, look at what you can be, and look at how much fun these people are having with what they're doing. When someone uh, has the feeling that they can use what they're about to learn, uh, where there's relevance for them, um, uh, I think we, we come closer to effectiveness and uh, students engage at a much higher level when we are uh, able to connect what we're teaching them to their own lives. We look at outputs in terms of being project-based. Can you actually apply these skills and create something? Uh, this is not fundamentally startling, new, or sexy, but overall it's effective. The pedagogical philosophy that the faculty member chooses to adopt makes a, a big impact on how the course works. Uh, the philosophy that I myself subscribe to and that I advocate at my college is one in which the students do a lot of the decision making uh, for themselves on the learning path towards the objectives of the course. So uh, technically that's called hudagogy, which is a, a philosophy of letting the learner uh, direct her or his own learning path. And so to that extent, I try to help faculty come up with uh, activities in the course in which students have a lot of choice so that they can select what topics to emphasize uh, and what particular issues to pursue in more depth than others uh, without losing the overall scope of what the content must be that still allows them to customize and, and it increases their, the student's intrinsic interest in the activities and, and in the content. If you're designing a course in such a fashion that the learners are taking charge of the teaching role, the design is the most important feature. The design is the way that you add your teaching presence to the learning environment. So you, if you design a course where the learning activities are effective and where the opportunities for students to take charge and direct their own learning path uh, are working and uh, are effective, 
then you have designed a course in which there will be progress toward learning of uh, the student learning outcomes will be achieved. Uh, teaching itself is a, uh, a, a sending out of information. Learning is the receiving of that information. The teacher doesn't have a lot of control over learning. The learners have control over the learning. And so it's the teacher's job to handle the motivation, the attention, the, cog the cognitive aspects of it, but it's the learner's responsibility to do the work. So if you can arrange the course so that it's the learners that are doing the work, you're probably going to have a successful course.